Καλησπέρα και καλώ ήρθατε σε άλλη μία λέξη εκφραστική ανάγνωση εν μέσω κορονοϊού 2021. Τορκουάτο Τάσο, The Liberation of Jerusalem, Canto 2. While thus the tyrant readies for the fight, Ismen, one day in private interview, seeks him. Ismen, that sorcerer whose might makes marble vaults yield up their corpses, who can charm new breath into them and new sight. Ismen, whose murmured spells will fright hell's crew and diss himself, whose fiends he conjures still for cursed tasks and chains or freeze at will. He now adores Muhammad, but he was a Christian once, nor utterly refuses his former rights, but mingles the two laws ill understood in vile and impious uses. Now from deep caverns, whither he withdraws from crowds of men and on his dark art muses, he, braving public peril, comes before his lord, to a bad king were a worse counsellor. Sire, said he, now nears without delay the victor army that our people fear. But let us do whatever do we may. Heaven aids, the world aids those who strong appear. The roles of king, of leader, well you play, wide ranging your concern, your foresight clear. If all your officers like you behave, your foe will find this country but a grave. I, for my part, am here, your comrade in danger and toil, to help in good and ill. I pledge my all, be it the wit lodged in my aged head, be it my magic skill. I'll make the rebel angels who have been banished from heaven parties to my will, that were my first enchantments I'll essay, and by what means I'll tell you straight away. Within the Christian's temple hidden lies an altar underground, where they have stowed her image, whom that rabble deifies as mother of their born and buried god. A veil conceals the simulacrum's eyes, and unquenched lamps make splendid its abode. Inside, the votive gifts hang, line on line, by credulous cultists carried to that shrine. Now this their effigy, snatched from its lair, I ask that you with your own hands transport into your mosque and re-erect it there. I'll work a charm upon it of such sort that it shall always give, while kept with care, fatal protection to your town and fort. Behind impervious walls, your reign shall be secure through this profound new mystery. So spoke he, and prevailed. Incontinent, the king rushed to the house of God, struck down the priests, and seized with rude, irreverent hands the chaste image, dragged it through the town, and brought it to that fane of devilment whose foul and foolish cult makes heaven frown. The sorcerer then, in that unholy place, hissed blasphemous whispers at the sacred face. But when the new dawn rose into the sky, the unclean temple's picked custodian found no sign of the image where it stood, and high and low searched vainly all the nearby ground. Straightway he told the king, who, goaded by the news into a fury without bound, strongly imagined that some Christian may have been the thief and hidden it away. Our pious, all pious soul that secret deed had planned, or outraged heaven had come to intervene, lest in so vile a place be forced to stand the image of its goddess and its queen. Was miracle, <clears throat> was miracle the cause, or mortal hand? Fame wavers still, yet it has ever been true piety, where zeal and pious laws pass human limits to deem heaven the cause. A king, pressing an inquest of the case, each church, each home has ransacked through and through, vows cruel torments or stupendous grace to who conceals or brings the thief to view. Without rest, too, by his dark arts and base, the sorcerer seeks the truth without a clue. Heaven hides its role or shields the culprit's name, thus putting all his magic spells to shame. But when the savage monarch, baffled, weans one Christian's crime concealed from him, his whole spite for all Christians through his mind careens. His anger flares, his rage knows no control. 
without compunction, come what will, he means to be avenged and ease his burning soul. My wrath none shall for nothing rouse, he said. Let all die so the unknown thief fall dead. Lest the offending guilty one be spared, the guiltless and the just alike shall bleed. Just, did I say? None of them ever cared for our religion. Each of that vile breed in his hostility sees his guilt declared. Believers, rise. He whom this new misdeed dooms not to this new purge, some old fault will. Rise, rise, take fire and sword, go burn and kill. Thus he harangues the mob. Rumour the news straightway among the timid faithful bore. They shook aghast with terror in their shoes. A present death seemed all they waited for. Defence or flight not one of them dared choose, nor seek excuse, nor mercy dared implore. And yet the people, panicked and dejected, find their salvation where they least expect it. Among them lived a virgin, grown of late to ripest maidenhood, lofty as a queen in form and mind, though she did beauty rate worthless, except as chastity's first queen. Her greatest merit is, she hides her great merit between the low walls of a mean abode, and from admiring gaze or moan removes herself, uncourted and alone. Yet there's no guard quite able to conceal a beauty worth espousal and applause. You, love, will not allow it, but reveal to one young man her glory and your laws. O oh, love, now blind, now Argus-like, who will seal our eyes one moment, and the next will cause them to see all. You've shown a thousand lovers past thousand guards to pierce the chastest covers. Sophronia, she's named, Belindo he. Both hold one faith, and in one city dwell. Great as her beauty is his modesty. He sighs, he little hopes, nor can he tell his burning love, nor quench its flame. And she scorns him, or does not heed, or heeds not well. Thus the poor man till now has served and dreamed unseen, or seen but ill, or ill-esteemed. Meanwhile, the edict is proclaimed. They hear their people doomed to piteous massacre. She, great in spirit as in virtue clear, conceives a plan of saving them. The spur to her design is courage, though the fear of shame and maiden honour bridle her. But courage wins, or rather comes to save her shamefastness, a shamefastness made brave. Right through the crowd that maid stepped forth alone, nor hid her beauties, nor made vain display. She walked with downcast eyes, a light veil thrown round her, all proud, yet modest in her way, adorned, yet negligent. Whether she shone or so fair by art or chance were hard to say. Her negligent airs the artifices are of nature, love and her auspicious star. Admired by all, but giving none a glance, the proud maid makes her way before the king, nor does his fierce glare check her bold advance. She holds his eyes despite their threatening. My lord, your wrath suspend, your people's hands restrain, she said, for I am here to bring captive to you the criminal you seek, and whom your vengeful ire you've sworn to wreak. By that chase, by that chaste boldness, that unlooked-for blaze, of high and saintly charms pierced through and through, the king, like one defeated in a gaze, in a daze, bridled his wrath, tempered his savage hue, and had either his character or her gaze been softer, he would have begun to woo, but adamant beauty cannot strongly move an adamant heart. Sly wiles are baits to love. Amazement, yes, desire, delight, but not love made commotion in his villainous heart. Go tell me all, he said. I vow that what you speak won't make your fellow Christian smart. And she, sir, I alone the theft did plot. I'm she who chose to play the felon's part. With these my hands I took the image. See, it's me you seek, and you must punish me. Thus offered she, faced with a general doom, her proud head took the blame herself alone. O oh, noble lie, 
Did ever truth presume to claim with fair a title virtue's throne? Here the fell tyrant hesitates, in whom yet ebbs the rage to which he's all too prone. Tell me, he asks, whose counsel did you heed, and who was your accomplice in the deed? I had no wish to share my glory or to yield one jot of it, said she. I led myself, was my sole friend and counsellor, and my sole agent. Why, then, your sole head shall to my dreadful vengeance answer for your deed, he countered. It is just, she said, if me alone such a high honour call, on me alone the punishment should fall. At this afresh the tyrant's rage is found. Where have you hid the image, he inquires. I did not hide, but burned it, said she, and to burn thus deemed worth all praise. Those fires at least will from the unbeliever's hand keep it inviolate from profane desires. Sir, on the plunder or the thief lay hands, one you'll see never. Here the other stands. Yet I still nothing, nor am I the thief. It's only right to seize what's wrongly taken. At this the tyrant's rage beyond belief explodes, his fury past all measures shaken. Chaste heart, high mind, fair face, all come to grief, and every hope of pardon lies forsaken. Against his wrath, love seeks in vain to wield her purity's armour or her beauty's shield. They seize the lovely maid, and, cruel groan, the king condemns her unto death by flame. They rend her veil, her cloak, her virgin zone, and her soft arms in cruel fetters frame. Silent, her brave heart undismayed, alone she stands, though somewhat indie moved by shame, her lovely face drained to a hue, not quite a mortal pallor, but a bashful white. When the great case was published far and wide, the, gra the crowd had gathered. There Olindo went. Known was the crime, the culprit undercried. He, we he vaguely feared his lady might be mend. Now the fair captive came, not only tried, but doomed already. Now henchmen, in henchmen intent on their fell task, were hustling her along. He saw and hurtled wildly through the throng. He shouted to the king, Not she, not she performed the theft that her mad words avow. How could one woman plan, or dare, or see such a task through, unskilled, unaided? How could she deceive the guards? How secretly make fly the divine image? Ask her now. Not she, my lord, stole it, but I. So hot he loved, poor man, his love, who loved him not. High in your mosque, he added then, if you opens to dawn and day, to that height come, climbing by night, I forced an entry through small nooks, such daunting paths I dared. In some, to me the honour, to me death is due. Let not this girl usurp my martyrdom. Mine are these chains. Only for me this fire is kindled, and for me is heaped this pyre. Sophronia lifts her face and looks at him, a sad humanity in a pitying gaze. Why here, poor innocent, what frenzied whim or foolish plan showed or compelled these ways? Can I not then, without you, face the grim wrath by myself that one mere man displays? I also have a heart that dares to be alone in death and seeks no company. In vain she speaks. Her lover will nowise unspeak his words or from his claim retreat. O oh, mighty spectacle, brave enterprise, at which love and magnanimous virtue meet in strange contention. Death the victor's prize, and life the loathed condition of defeat. But now... The more each vies to take the blame, the more the king's incensed with rage and shame. He thinks they mock the pains he can decree, and disrepute upon his honour call. Let both their tales be credited, says he. Their struggles palm to whom it may let fall. He gives a nod. His sergeants instantly the youth and fetters to the scaffold hall. Thus both alike the single stake embrace, lashed back to back, and face away from face. Already round them faggots are piled high, and bellows to the rising flames applied, when from the youth there burst a wrenching sigh, and he to her thus tethered with him cried, Is this the knot, then, that my hope did tie, to bind us lifelong at each other's side? 
Is this the fire that would, I dreamt, ignite our conjoined hearts in ardour and delight? Not these the bonds love promised, not this blaze, not these which fate perforce makes us endure. Too well, woes me, she once estranged our ways, but now in death makes our encounter sure. Yet I, though I must die so strangely, praise one fact. Though on no bridal bed, I am your spouse on this pyre. Your doom alone I rue, not mine, since I die side by side with you. And oh, how greatly would my lot be blessed, my sweet and lucky torments made how whole, if it befell that my breast on your breast, when on your mouth I have breathed out my soul, write then your last sighs, even as you lay pressed upon my lifeless body from your bosom stole. So speaks he, sobbing as he speaks. She tries to counsel him, and in soft words replies. Not these the thoughts, my friend, not these laments, but loftier themes the time requires. Your sins repent, recall the ample recompense, God's promised kingdom that each good soul wins. In his name suffer. Sweet those punishments will feel that bear you where high bliss begins. Look at the sky, how fair, look at the sun, there shines our comfort to that feast we run. Now with one voice the mob of heathens wailed. The faithful too to soft tears gave way. Something the most, I know not what, prevailed in the king's hard heart, like pity gone astray. He sensed it, and it angered him, and failed while he his eyes averted turned away. You alone stand, Sophronia, not enthralled, general weeping, though bewept by all. While peril thus engulfs them, see, a knight, for such he seemed, appears, noble in guise, towering in shape, so armed and strangely dight that clearly from a distant land he hies. Atop his crest a tigress burnished bright attracts the eyes of all famous device, device known as Clorinda's badge in war. They think this must be she, and right they were. All womanly observances and skills she has despised since her unripest years. Her proud hands scorned employment on all frills, Arachne's toil, the needle, thread and shears. Soft gowns and bowers she fled, for in the hills and fields too virtue can feel safe from fears. With noble pride her countenance she arms, she keeps it stern, and yet her sternness charms. While still a girl with child's hand, she would dare to tense or ease the mighty course's bit. She mastered lance and sword, and the tilled yard's air made tough her limbs, and for the race course fit. Hard on the track of lion fierce, or bear, on mountain crags, or in forests would she flit. War was her goal. When through the woods she ran, men feared her like a beast, beasts like a man. From Persia she has come, once more to try her force against those Christians she did brave before this, scattering their hacked limbs by the shore, mingling their lifeblood with a wave. Now, as she first arrives, there greets her eye this preparation for a fiery grave. Eager to see and know what criminal course condemns the culprits, she spurs on her horse. The crowd gives way. And even as she nears the fettered couple, while her steed she checks, she sees how one is silent, one in tears, with greater strength shown by the weaker sex, yet sees his tears are not like his who fears his pains, but whom another's torments vex. The silent other, eyes fixed on the sky, seems dead to this world, not about to die. Touched by that sight, Clorinda sought relief in tears of pity for their shared distress. Yet most she grieves for her who shows no grief, more moved by silence, by lamenting less. But then she turned, keeping her sorrow brief, to a greybeard by her side among the press. Tell me, good man, who are these two? What leads them to the torture? Fate? Or their evil deeds? Thus she inquired, and he to her request made terse but full reply. She heard, intent, astonished his account, and quickly guessed that both of them alike were innocent. At once their death she swears within her breast, be it by pleas or armed force to prevent. She rushes to the fire, beats down the flames which rise already, and to the guards exclaims, 
O oh, you who share this cruel office now, do not proceed, let no one be so bold, until I've parleyed with the king. I vow your tardiness shall not cause him to scold. The officers obeyed her with a bow, by her great regal mien cowed and controlled. She turned, seeking the king, and moved to greet him as she saw him coming through the street. I am Clorinda, said she, and my name is not, perhaps, unknown to you. To fight by you, my lord, in the defence I came of our religion and your royal right. Command me to whatever goal you frame. Great tasks I fear not, nor contemn the slight. Deploy my arm in the open field, or use me on your walls. There's nothing I refuse. She said no more. The king replied. What land so far from Asia, or the highway of the sun, O glorious virgin, but that there your grand deeds are acclaimed and your high fame has run. Now that your sword is joined to mine, I stand consoled for troubles and afraid of none. If a vast army join, joined me now, my hope of victory would have no surer scope. Already Godfrey seems to me too long in coming here. Use me, you say? I draw but one conclusion. You shine best among deeds of high danger, acts of utmost awe. I say, let our whole garrison your strong sceptre obey, be your commands their law. So spoke he. She did courteously repay his praise with thanks, but then went on to say, It certainly may seem a novel thing for payment to precede the service, yet your goodness makes me hope. Give me, O king, these two condemned in lieu of future debt. Make it a boon. Indeed, their suffering on such slight evidence seems hard. But let this pass. Also let pass the vivid sense that moves me to maintain their innocence. I only say the common story was that Christians took the image, and that you agreed. Not so, I think, and not because I deem whatever I may think is true. It was a lack of reverence for our laws to do the deed the sorcerer urged you to. For we are not free in temples to install idols, idols of others least of all. Therefore, to great Muhammad, I impute the miracle of this deed, to admonish us that it is most unlawful to pollute with alien practices his sacred house. Let his men conjure, let him substitute his wants for weapons. May he prosper thus. Let us be knights with swords to cut and thrust. That is our art. That only should you trust. This, shed, <clears throat> this said, she spoke no more. The king, although he found scant pity in his wrathful heart, desired to please her. Reason prods him so, and she, the prayer's source, has potent art. Let them have life, he said, and let them go, since such an intercessor takes their part. Call it my justice or my grace, I waive their guilt, or guilty give them you to save. So freed they were. Truly, Elindo's fate was fortunate, since through his this deed at last his love let love her generous heart dilate. He goes from stake to altar, having passed from lover to beloved, ye changed state from criminal to husband. In the past he would have died with her. He does not die, nor scorns she now to live with him for aye. But to the mind of the distrustful king, such, such virtue joined so near him boded ill. Thus both went into exile, wandering far from Judea's borders by his will. And he, in his hard mood continuing, casts others out, others his prisons fill. Torn from their small babes, the sad way they tread from aged parents and sweet marriage bed. Cruel division, he ousts only those in body sound and spirited in mind. But the mild sex and feeble age who chose like hostages in pledge to keep behind. Crowds lived as outcasts. Some as rebels rose, and these in rage, not fear, new power find. They joined the Franks upon that very day when to Emmaus they had made their way. Emmaus is a town short distance parts from royal Salem. Anyone, if he please, who, walking slowly and at leisure, Starts at sunrise, may by noons reach it with ease. Oh, how to hear this stirs all Frankish hearts! How all the more their zeal and haste increase! But since, past noon, the sun declines from hence, the captain bids them here to pitch the tents. So pitched they were, post-haste, 
and now almost the sun's kind lamp had gained the ocean's rim, when two great barons rode up to the host, foreign in bearing, decked with alien trim, though their pacific attitude disclosed to Godfrey that they came as friends to him. Legates they are from Egypt's great domain, and throngs of squires and pages form their train. One is Alethes, who, baseborn, began in the gross business of the common herd, but rose to be his king's most honoured man, be by fecund, sugared, cunning speech preferred, by flattering ways and by a mind that can beguile at will, and warp and twist each word, master of calumnies, who found strange ways to slander in the act of giving praise. The other is Circassian Argent, who, as a stranger, came to Egypt's royal seat, but then too satrap of the empire grew to make the army's high command complete. Impatient, ruthless, savage he, who knew nor weariness in warfare nor defeat. Spurner of all, holding no god in awe, the sword alone his reason and his law. These two request an audience, and they, led into pious Godfrey's presence, find him seated with his dukes in plain array, placed on a low chair of no special kind. But true worth, though neglectful of display, is in itself most spe splendidly enshrined. A trifling curtsy Argent makes to him, like a great man indulging some slight whim. Alethes, though, with right hand on his breast, bowed low his head, his eyes upon the ground, and as great worship unto him addressed as might not to his people's shame redound. And through his lips, when he began, there pressed a flood of eloquence, honey-sweet in sound. The Franks, who had by now well sped in learning Syrian, followed all he said. O oh, you, whom worthily alone obey these many heroes worthy of their fame, who know that all their past palms present sway from your great self and your great counsels came. Beyond all seed, beyond all seeds, get what guideposts far away, as now among us here resounds your name. In Egypt's every nook reports has sown bright tales of the high valour you have shown. Not one among the multitude who hear but hears as one might hear a miracle. Yet to my king such miracles appear, not wonders merely, but delights as well. What others envy you, or others fear, he loves in you, nor tires to hear them tell. He loves your valour, and would gladly sue in love, if not in law, to join with you. And by such pleasing sentiments spurred on, in peace and friendship he extends his hand. Seal them with yours, and may the bond upon joint honour, if not joint religion, stand. Yet, since he learned that you had hither drawn to drive an ally from his throne and land, he bade us, lest more evil come behind, here to declare to you his royal mind. That mind is this. If you will be content with all that war has thus far made your gain, nor touch Judea, nor with hostile bend seek other regions favoured by his reign, he in return will promise to augment your none too firm estate. And when you twain combine, will not the Turks and Persians groan, robbed of all hope to repossess their own? My lord, such great things in small time you've won, their fame for untold ages must endure. Masses of warriors, cities crushed, undone, hardships surmounted, strange roads and unsure. Fear and amazement from you crying run through nearby lands and provinces obscure. And if you had more conquests still to gain, you would seek more than is yours right now in vain. Now is your glorious peak, in days to come, and certain war is better to eschew, since if you win, although your powers grow some, yet your renown you could nowise outdo, and power once gained may quickly fade. In sum, both fame and power might thus be lost to you. Foolish and proud, who risks gambling with fate, for small, uncertain gain, gains sure and great. But if so moved by counsellors, who perhaps repine when others long maintain their sway, your sense that your success has seen no lapse, and your innate desire, that ardent ray, whose noblest fire the noblest heart enwraps, to make whole nations serve and tribute pay, perhaps tempt you to flee from peace as far as a less venturous man might flee from war, such thoughts might plead with you to persevere alone the way fate has wide open thrown, not to lay down that sword that all men fear, whose virtue augurs victory alone, 
till all Muhammad's laws shall disappear, till through you Asia be a desert grown. Such words are sweet to hear, sweet are the lies from which too often dire disasters rise. But if your courage does not blind your sight, nor darken reason's light within your mind, you'll know that, if you undertake that fight, reasons for fear and not for hope you'll find. For fortune varies fickly on her height, now to our joy, now to our grief inclined. Where highest flights do most abruptly soar, precipitous falls are commonly in store. Tell me, if Egypt now should strike a blow, potent in gold and arms and counsel, and if Persia's armies and the Turks also, and Kassan's sons to boot, made a new stand, what strength do me what strength to meet war's fury raging so have you to dodge once more disaster's hand? To trust the wicked Greek, perhaps, you'll try whom holy treaties bind as your ally? The faith of Greeks, who knows not how it fares, one treason shows all treasons they can do. No, thousands show it, since a thousand snares that faithless, greedy folk has laid for you. Do you think who blocked your passage once now dares to risk his life by aiding you, or who denied those roads that were the common good will make you now a present of his blood? But you, your every hope perhaps repose in the battalion seated round you now. Foes whom you once beat piecemeal, do you suppose you'll likely once more in one heap lay low, even if your ranks are thinner now by those whom war and har hardship took, you best know how. And though a new foe massed against your works, the Egyptian host with Persians joined and Turks. Now if indeed you think your fate will be that you shall never perish by the sword, grant this be so, and grant that the decree of heaven with your unbent will accord, yet famine will undo you, and when she strikes, what by God shall save you then, O God? Go shake your lance at her, go and pursue her with your sword, pretend to that triumph too. The fields lie burned and spoiled for miles around. The provident farmer's hands have left them dead, and in high towers behind thick walls have bound their sheaves long days before your hither sped. You who, so bold, so far your way have found, how shall your steeds now or your men be fed? You say, we have the navy for that end. Does then your life upon the winds depend? And does your luck, perhaps, command the winds, and at your whim bind them, or set them free? The sea, deaf to all prayers and cries, it minds perhaps your voice alone and your decree? Moreover, since a league already binds Persians and Turks, what will befall if we join them and raise a huge fleet to repulse with that united power your wooden hulls? A double victory, my lord, you'll need to clinch the honours of this enterprise. Deep shame to you a single loss will breed, and from it damage deeper yet will rise. For if our naval force were to succeed in scattering yours, your camp of hunger dies. And if you are on land to perish, vain will be a victory on the bounding main. Now if in such a state you will still refuse to Egypt's great king terms of truce and peace, your mind... Let truth have license here, pursues a course that with your virtue ill agrees. But heaven grant that the intent you choose, if bent on war, may change and let war cease, that Asia may once more breathe without tears, while you reap victory's harvest with your peers. And all of you, in toil, in peril, and in glory, his companions, be not you so far misled by fortune's favouring hand, as duped by her to urge the war anew, but, like a pilot who guides back to land from treacherous seas his vessel and his crew, trim your broad sails now, homeward bound and free, nor ever more attempt the cruel sea. Here ceased Alethes. A low murmur went about the room from the brave hero's throat. Their every gesture shows how they resent the thoughts which he insinuates and promotes. The captain turned his eyes all round the tent three or four times, and every face he notes, then fixed his gaze full face upon the man, awaiting his reply, and thus begun. Sir Messenger, you've pleasantly made clear, now courteously, now with veiled threats, your drift. If your king loves me, or holds my exploits dear, that's grace in him, his love a welcome gift. 
Those later headings where your threats appear, claiming United Pag Pagandom will lift swords to take war to make war on us, I'll now gainsay in words both frank and plain, as is my way. Know then that we've endured so much till now on sea, on land, in daylight or in gloom, solely to make an open road allow access to those great walls, that holy tomb, and to gain grace in God's eyes, studying how to free his folk from harsh enslavement's doom. Nor feel we burdened when so great an aim makes us risk land or life or worldly fame. For not ambitious pride nor lust for gain spurred on or guided this our undertaking, and may our heavenly Father that foul stain, if any of us feel it inly waking, expunge, not, nor let contag contagion in him remain, who eats those poison sweets to his unmaking. No, we are led by him whose grace can steal into the stoniest heart and once more make it feel. This is what moved, what moves us, this our guide, this saves us from all danger and distress, levels the mountains, dries the rivers wide, cools summer's heat, melts winter's ice, and, yes, smooths every storm tossed below of the tide, chains winds or sets them free, now more, now less. This lets high walls be breached, burnt to the ground, and hosts be slain and scattered all around. From this our zeal, from this our hope is born, not from our frail strength, wearied with alarms, nor from our fleet, nor from the heaps of corn Greece may supply or not, nor from French arms. So long as his hand leaves us not forlorn, we have small fear of any other harms. He whom that hand protects or strikes for knows he needs no other aid to ward off blows. But say his hand from us withholds its aid, for sins of ours or his deep destiny, why should we repine to find our bodies laid where God's own body once did buried lie? We'll die, careless of life and unafraid. We'll die, but unavenged we shall not die. Our fate shall not be Asia's merriment, nor we the ones our dying makes lament. Do not think all the same, that we abhor all peace, or in mere deadly war lust burn. For your king's friendship gives us pleasure, nor are we averse his friendship to return. Judea is, you know, not his. Therefore, why should about it, why show about it such intense concern? Let him not grudge our conquest of a throne elsewhere, and let him calmly keep his own. This was his answer, but the words did pierce bold Argan's bosom with a sting of rage. Nor did he hide it, but with grimace fierce fronted the captain, saying, There's no age when strife had to be dragged in by the ears. Who fails his chance for peace, war let him wage. And well you've shown that you all peace refuse, turning deaf ears on the first words we use. Then he snatched up his mantle by the seam, furled it, and formed a sack with it. That sack he held aloft, and so resumed his theme, with yet more spite pursuing his attack. O oh, you, to whom dread deeds so easy seem, this pouch holds peace or war, welfare or rack. Yours be the choice. Take counsel in your breast at once, and pick what pleases you the best. That savage gesture and the words he spoke moved all to shout, War! in a general cry, and even as their clamouring awoke, not pausing for great sailed Godfrey's reply, the ruffian loosed his pouch, shook out his cloak. To deadly war, cried he, I you defy. His mien so fierce, his voice so full of hate, that Janus' temple seemed to burst its gate. In opening that pouch, it seemed he drew mad rage from it and savage discord, and blazing in his dread eyes it seemed there grew Electos and Megaera's firebrand. So looked perhaps that old and giant who made Error's tower against heaven stand. Like very babble, he too struts and jars, with looming frontage menacing the stars. Then Godfrey added, Go apprise your king that he may come. Let him make haste the while, for we accept the war you're threatening. If not, let him await us by his Nile. Kindly and pleasant, then, at leave-taking, he honoured them with gifts of the choicest style. A helmet brave he did a leaf his yield, part of his rich spoil from Nicaea's field. Argand received a sword. The ingenious smith had get gemmed the golden heft and hilled so fair, so masterly, their rich substance grew with his workmanship to worth beyond compare. 
Viewing its temper, ornament and pith with admiration, the utmost care, Argand told Bouillon, Soon enough, you'll see the way your gift is put to use by me. To his companion, once they're out of view, he says, Hence let us go our separate ways. I to Jerusalem, toward Egypt you. You with a dawn's sun, I by night's dim rays. For neither I nor my report can do much good where you go in the next few days. Do you take back their answer? I don't mean to move far from this place where war's the scene. Thus from ambassador he turns to foe, as stormy haste or ripe occasion calls. The law of nations and old customs show he little wrecks, nor cares whom he appalls. Awaiting no reply, he moves below the silent, friendly stars toward the walls, impatient of delay, and whom he leaves behind is of a scarcely less impatient mind. Now it was night, when deep repose did hold the waves and winds. The world grew mute, until all weary creatures, whether those that rolled in waves of ocean, lake, or woodland rill, or those four-footed ones in den or fold, or bright-hued birds curled in their nests, grew still in the great calm that darkness held in keep, and soothed their fears and lulled their hearts with sleep. But not the faithful army, not their lord, go slumbering, nor even rest, so whole is their desire that the sky award glad dawn, long hungered for by every soul to light their path and guide them to the adored city, which is their crossing glorious goal. Time after time they look to see some ray break forth, or dark night brighten into day. Calvary.